Well, hello and welcome everybody to another Kickstarter colloquium. As usual, I will start with a few quick reminders before I introduce today's speakers. Uh, first of all, these, record, these uh, colloquia are all being recorded for the benefit of uh, viewers on YouTube. Uh, so if you prefer that your image is not recorded, then please kindly keep your camera off during the speaker's uh, talk. And in the interest of hearing the speaker clearly, please mute your microphone if you're not the one actually speaking. You are very welcome to post questions to either speaker at any time during the talk. Um, please use the Zoom chat for that, and we will come to that all of the questions in a discussion section. So without further ado, uh, for today's colloquium, I'm delighted to welcome Aidan Sedgwick and Jakob Jortland. With the fire hose of alerts that LSST is expected to produce, um, an essential tool for deriving useful science is going to be some kind of software package that can help us select those targets that we are most interested in and do it in real time. So Aidan is going to describe a package that he's developed to do just that. Jakob, meanwhile, specializes in techniques to measure the redshifts to extragalactic objects using just the photometric measurements that LSST will produce. This, of course, is going to be vital for the characterization of many objects that Rubin will discover, since the survey will reach magnitudes well beyond what we can measure with spectroscopy. And so with that, uh, I will hand over to our speakers. And um, Jakob, I believe you are the first up. Take it away. Thank you very much for that introduction. Let me just share my screen. All right, you should all be able to see my screen, correct? We can. Great, thank you. So, as you said, my project is on the probabilistic estimation of photometric redshift, which I have performed in collaboration with Krista Gall, Christopher Facebook Smith, and Jeff Hudson from MBI and DPU Compute, respectively. So, as you mentioned, a lot of the science requirements or science goals for LSST require photometric redshift. And specifically, we require both accurate point measures of photometric redshift and well calibrated errors on these photometric redshifts. Now, for the point measures, certain metrics or goals have been set for uh, methods that are currently being developed. Specifically, we have three metrics called the RMS scatter, the outlier fraction, and the bias, where the science book three places minimum requirements of at least 0 0.05 for RMS scatter in point measures of photoses, an outlier fraction uh, below at least 0.1, and a bias in photoses below at least 0 0.01. Now, there are many different uh, photo, photo C estimation methods out there, some template-based, some machine learning-based. And some, uh, or many of these uh, come with range or uh, beat these minimum requirements, but no method so far actually uh, fully fulfills all of these requirements. Now, in this project, we attempt to use mach the machine learning methods to tackle uh, both of these uh, ambitious uh, metric uh, requirements and uh, also generate well-calibrated probability density functions over photoses. Now, to do this, we have three different models. First of all, a Gaussian mixture model plus a mixture density network, then a variational autoencoder plus a mixture density network, and finally, a semi-supervised variational autoencoder. Now, what all of these methods have in common is that they in some way make use of unlabeled data, that is data where we purely have photometry, and then a smaller subset of data where we have both photometry and spectroscopically confirmed redshifts to predict photo C uh, probability density functions. In addition, all these three methods have some kind of approach towards breaking the degeneracy between the spectroscopic class, uh, extinction, and redshift. Now, the first approach um, is a combination between an infant Gaussian mixture model, sorry, excuse me, Ga infant Gaussian mixture model which is an unsupervised clustering algorithm. Here, we give it some photometric input X, and it then spits out some number of probabilities relating to N different Gaussian, uh, Gaussian distributions in the input space. Now, in this way, we can then assign probability uh, that our input belongs to one of these different N different clusters. 
when we have this intimate Gaussian mixture model, we can then use these cluster causalities together with our original input and use that as input for a mixture density network. Now, a mixture density network is a deep, uh, deep learning model that takes some input and then performs supervised learning that is essentially regression using some linear combination of Gaussians, uh, thus the mixture density network uh, component of it. This is represented by the output means, standard deviations, and weights alpha. Now, the pros of this model are that it's accessible, simple to train, and has been proven to have good performance in Ansari et al. 2020. Now, the cons are that we cluster in the input space, we have disconnected and we have disconnected components, and we need to optimize these separately. So regarding clustering in the input space, we essentially reproduce a lot of the information in the input instead of uh, what they call reducing down to more informative space. Regarding disconnected components, this means that we have to train uh, the infant Gaussian mixture model first and then train our mixture density network on top of that. And the same goes for optimization. This means that our unsupervised model and our supervised model do not necessarily inform each other. Now for model two, we swap out the infant Gaussian mixture model with a variation of now, a variational autoencoder is essentially a model that takes some kind of input and then attempts to learn a distribution over some reduced dimensional latent space, represented by the L over here and PL given X, samples from this distribution, and then attempts to use this sample to recreate the input given by this distribution PX prime given L. Now, in our setup, we include an extra step where we transform X to X prime. This represents a Monte Carlo sampling of our input within the photometric errors, such that we attempt to propagate or at least make our model aware of uncertainties on the photometry. Now, once we train this variational encoder and learn some lower dimensional informative space representing our input, we then use this latent space as input for a mixture density network. Once again, attempting to learn some problem density function over photo C given an input. Now the pros of this model are that we are clustering in a reduced feature space. So instead of doubling up our feature space uh, as in model one, we are reducing the dimension that would be offered. And in this sense, um, creating a more informative uh, feature space. And within the feature space, we would then expect better clustering or better separation since we're reducing dimensionality. Now, in addition to this, the model is relatively simple to train. Regarding cons, however, we still have this issue that we're essentially training two different models one at a time. And in this sense, our unsupervised component where we purely have metric data and our supervised component where we do have spectroscopic redshift do not inform each other. So we might have a really good representation of our data in this latent space, but it might at all actually be useless with regard to um, regression uh, or prediction of these photoses. Finally, we have model three, which was the semi-supervised variational on encoder. Now, after model two, we first want to call a sample our inputs from X to X prime to propagate photometric errors. Then we input this into a regressor model, which is a deep neural uh, network, where we try to predict the photo C distribution P set given X prime and sample a photo uh, a redshift from the distribution. We then take our original input together with this sample and pass that into the encoder in our variational on encoder, predicting a latent space, but this time instead of being PL given X, it is now PL given X and set. We then sample from this distribution as well and use our sample from the latent space and our sample from our photo C space and pass this to the decoder, again, attempting to reconstruct our input. Now, this model has pros in the sense of, again, clustering in a reduced feature space. So we are trying to learn some informative representation of our input. But more importantly, we're performing joint optimization. So we no longer have the step where in which we train one model, use it as inputs for another model. Instead, we are training both the using the photometric uh, data and the spectroscopically confirmed data at the same time. And in this sense, we can draw information from the much larger 
non-spectroscopically confirmed data set and use that to inform the photo C distribution that we learned during training. <clears throat> Finally, uh, since we learn all these different distributions, we can combine them in different ways uh, to sample from other distributions of interest, for example, a joint distribution P, Z, comma, X, which could potentially be used for outliers lending if we could link that to uh, catastrophic outliers. Cons, however, are that this model is hard to implement and correspondingly also hard to train. So I guess something for something in this case, right? Now, the current state of this project uh, is that we've implemented models two and models three, and we spent the last few months actually refactoring the full code base. So none of these models are implemented in standard packages and thus need to be implemented from scratch. And this refactor has included multiple steps. First of all, it's re uh, included addition of default configurations using Hydra, which is a configuration uh, manager, which means that it's easy to construct new models. Um, and this synergizes as well with another feature we've added into this package, which is PML, which is an ML ops experiment tracking software. This means that we can easily track what specific git commit of the uh, version of our code we use for a given experiment run, what configuration file, what model architecture, what data set, et cetera, meaning we vastly increase reproducibility and documentation of experiments. In addition to this, we've had some quality of life improvements, including unit testing of the full package together with documentation included as well. Finally, regarding Model 3, as mentioned before, hard to implement, hard to train, and currently we are experiencing numerical issues with this, but sadly, I will not be presenting results from Model 3 just yet. Instead, uh, I'd like to present results for Model 2 on FCSS uh, DR17 plus otherwise. Um, and this specific data set we use uh, Include PSS and model magnitude to the UGRI set bounds and also W1, W2 bounds from Wise. In addition to this, we include measures of I band extinction from SDSS and require set certain constraints on the fractional error or uncertainty on spectroscopic redshift, having that be below 0 0.01, and ensuring that magnitude errors are below 0.3. Now, just to visualize the data set we work with in this case here, I compare the photometric data set with the spectroscopically confirmed data set, splitting it up in spectroscopic classes. And we see there's pretty good agreement between the bulk of the photometric data set and the spectroscopically confirmed object in I band. Now, in addition to this, if we break it up into redshift space for the spectroscopically uh, confirmed uh, classes, we can see that the data set is dominated by low redshift galaxies. While once we go up to about uh, redshift 0.5, we see that the data set is equally dominated by galaxies and quasars, with quasars continuing to dominate as we go to higher redshift. And then we have a small smattering of spectroscopically confirmed stars in the data set as well. Now, the model I'll be presenting is the baseline M2. So, how do we define a baseline? Well, in our case, the way we've done this is by taking a, uh, what's it called, um, a subsample of our data set, extracting that and using that as our uh, August, or, yeah, optimization sample, and then trying to force our model to overfit the data. So this involves turning off all forms of recognition, that is terms in our loss function that would prevent the model from overfitting. And I know this sounds kind of counterintuitive, but when doing this, we try to find the minimum architecture that can overfit. In this case here, the architecture you can see on the screen here. We then retrain the model, turning on regularization to prevent overfitting. In this way, we should be able to contain all data in the model. When training this, we first train the variation autoencoder. And here you see the latent space representation of the spectroscopically confirmed data set. Uh, for this model. Here I've reduced the seven dimensions down to two using the UMAP algorithm. You can see there's pretty good separation between galaxies, quasars, and stars. And if we look at the log C, uh, let me just highlight here, log C representation, we can see that there's pretty good uh, separation between low redshift up here, intermediate redshift, and high redshift. 
we do still see some overlap between quasars, galaxies, uh, and galaxies, which is to be expected. If we then uh, calculate the point measures of the spectroscopic redshift from the produced distribution of the mixture density network, in this case, we use the peak, uh, peak redshift and plot that versus uh, the spectroscopic redshift here. In grayscale, you see uh, non outliers, and in the red scale, you see outliers. And we see here that, I mean, just uh, also quant uh, qualitatively, that we have quite a low outlier fraction. On the other hand, uh, there's not really much systematics in how our, in our outliers are spread out uh, in the space. Now, for those of you that were in an earlier presentation I held on this, we did have some systematics due to uh, above 0 0.05 due to the mixture of uh, quasars and galaxies, uh, which I believe still to be present in here. But instead, I do think that the outlier scatter that we really see here, which is quite enormous in some cases, um, is due to the fact that the models trained here did overfit at one point. Now, this was purely due to user error. So, of course, room for improvement there. But uh, I find it confident to see these results, even in the case where we did overfit and we would expect generalization to be, to be worse. Now, finally, we calculate metrics. Uh, in this case, for the point measures, we do this both in median values, peak values, and weighted means. We see here that the weighted means are quite uh, a bit worse than the peak and median values, which I believe is due to the modality in the distributions produced by the mixture density network, meaning that our point measures lie in low probability mass regions of the distribution. Now, comparing the median and peak, they're quite similar, except for the bias where the peak performs an order of magnitude better. Now, we see the bias that we actually are two orders of magnitude better than the minimum requirement uh, by, science, uh, by LSST, while for the outlier fraction, we have an order of magnitude uh, better uh, or below the requirement uh, at 1%, roughly. <clears throat> Finally, we have the RMS scatter represented by sigma. Uh, I don't know, by sigma here. And we see here that we are just about an order of magnitude above the minimum requirement of 0.5. So sadly, it's not three for three. Even if we calculate the filtered RMS scatter where we remove any outliers identified, then we are still above uh, the minimum requirement here. Finally, for comparison with other literature, we calculate the NMAD scatter, which essentially is the median, uh, median of the scatter instead of the RMS. Now, uh, beyond point measures, I also mentioned that we want to have well calibrated probability density functions for these photometric redshift distributions. To measure this, we calculate a quantile quantile count uh, for the full ensemble of the test set. And here we then plot the uh, quantiles from our test set distributions versus expected quantiles, that is Q theory, where Q theory is just the range zero to one. And if we had perfectly calibrated distribution, we would expect a unit line in slope one going from zero to one. Now, the way we calculate this is by calculating um, what's called point measures of quantiles over all these distributions, and then measuring what fraction of spectroscopic redshifts are uh, what's called below these, uh, these calculated quantiles. We see here that there is quite good agreement between the expected, uh, what's it called, uh, between the expected uh, line and the calculated line, for example, implying that our distributions are quite well calibrated. If one had to be harsh, one can see that there is some underestimation at low Q and overestimation at high Q, which implies that we may underestimate errors or have our distributions be a bit too peaked. <clears throat> Finally, uh, with these results, the, or yeah, these results are always meeting the results, right? So one could, of course, look further into why exactly this QQ plot is as good as this, or look further into why we have the scatter we do see. And that is something I hope to work on within the next few months in uh, what to call a combination with also looking into optimized architecture. So right now we just have the overfitting architectures, but we could also use Bayesian optimization to generate better architecture. This is just postdoc corrections to better calibrate our probability density functions. 
And then the semi-supervised model, as I mentioned before, that has shown some promise, but has some very issues. So getting that to work properly so that we can compare with model two is definitely going to be a big focus. And finally, to confirm uh, what is called relevance relative P, we will be training these models on data from the DP0 as well uh, to see what kind of performance we have with the bands available there. All right, that was it for me. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Jakob. You've uh, gone through in just under 30 minutes at what is clearly a tremendous amount of work. So I will ask anyone, if you have a question for Jakob, please post it in the chat screens and we will come to each question in turn. Um, but to uh, get the ball rolling, Jakob, there's a wide variety of uh, machine learning techniques, both supervised and unsupervised. How did yeah. you narrow down your selection of which techniques you were you were aiming for? Was it mostly constrained by the need to determine the the photos ease at the end of the day? Was it determined by the problem itself? So in our case, first of all, this project was inspired by I'm sorry at uh, all. Uh, we're sorry, I'm sorry with a former PhD student at uh, Dark way in which he made use of this combination of an unsupervised clustering algorithm to break the generalities and then passing that on to a MDM that could predict probability density functions, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the two newer models were inspired by this concept, where which we then saw, we tried to see, can we break this degeneracy in any, any better ways than just this inferred Gaussian mixture model? Mm -hmm. um, finally, the yeah, finally, the semi-supervised approach was inspired by one of the later papers by the researcher who created the variational autoencoder, way in which one could make use of both labeled and unlabeled data at the same time. Now, this was mainly used for classification in their publication, and I haven't seen anyone use it for actual regression as we're trying to do. Mm. But but we thought that that would be really interesting to look into because typically one sees better performance when you do a joint optimization instead of training things separately and having this kind of two-stage rocket, right? Because although that works in rocket science, right, where you have two stages, it doesn't always work in machine learning processes where, as I mentioned, you know, one model is optimized uh, in regards to one specific loss function or goal that doesn't really care about what the second stage actually needs, right? Mm. So um, that was essentially the argumentation for model three, just trying to, you know, take this a step further. That makes sense. So if anyone else has any questions for Jakob, please post them in the chat. I am interested in how the uncertainties of are estimated from the, the model two and the model three. Is there a pros and cons between the two techniques in recovering the actual uncertainties on the final photo Z measurement? No. So those are actually exactly the same since our uh, output product is a full distribution over uh, that is P set given X, oh. right? Then one could, of course, oh, choose okay. to use uh, what's it called the median as an output value and then quantiles uh, corresponding to plus minus one sigma in a Gaussian, right? As uncertainties. But that oh, essentially okay. is up to the end user since the models do uh, actually as output produce samples from the distribution, right? So akin to MCMC, MCMC you have full chains for every every single uh, test input. Oh, that's nice. That's a mm. very nice feature. Interesting. I had one other question. If uh, nobody else has any questions they'd like to raise, you mentioned clear ML to uh, track the yeah. experiment at one point. Could you tell us a little more about that? It's the first time I've heard of it. Yes, uh, I guess no. you know what, not much, much to go back to the line, it just has the logo anyways, a bit cozy. But uh, essentially ClearML is one of the many tools in private sector being used within the umbrella of machine learning operations or MLOps. So these are the tools built on one of the bigger issues in machine learning, which is reproducibility, right? You mm -hmm. might run a model but not have documented, you know, what specific version of your code you're using, what specific data set you're using, what version of that data set, or what configuration you're using for your code, right? Oh, right. I think, you know, a very 
an epidemic that also exists in research, right? Where at least I know I've been guilty of you know, creating multiple copies of the same file, changing the, the file name, and then changing parameters and running it that way, right? And you just yeah. have no idea what was actually used. In this case here, using very few lines of code, you can then get ML uh, PML to log all of these things. It logs what uh, Git uh, Git commit you are currently on for those of you that use Git to track your code. It logs what configuration files or what uh, arguments have been passed to your code by the command line. It mm -hmm. automatically track in the case of uh, what's it called machine learning models via TensorFlow or PyTorch. It automatically tracks metrics uh, akin to, for example, TensorFlow logging, plot, ash, or training. And you can also manually identify, or you know, uh, what's it called, log different values as you're training. And in this sense, it essentially makes it really easy to log all these values. And then you have a visual interface where, or graphical interface where we can then compare different experiments. Mm -hmm. So this is also useful outside of machine learning. So I will be using it in other projects to track different runs of code and different experiments. Yeah, I was just thinking it. This is not specific to uh, machine learning at all, is it? That's a not generally necessary. useful tool. Thank you for exactly. that. And yeah, I mean, benefit on top of that is it's open source. So, oh, perfect! Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Warren. I see your hand up. Hey, um, uh, what would be the use of having um a small set of pretty deep uh, spectroscopic data to help with the training? Is, do you have any plans for for trying to get hold of a you know s some high redshift you know, small galaxy or you know a range of different sorts of galaxies over you know pu pushing out to the, the the highest possible redshift is there, is there much utility much need for some I... additional data like that what do you think I mean, that of course depends on what you want to use the photo CEs for in, in the end of it, right? Uh, I mean, because our models are only going to be as good as the data we give it. So in that sense, if we had high, especially properly confirmed high redshift galaxies in uh, connection with the bands that a given model has been trained on, then we could fine tune the model and let it, you know, learn from that data as well, such that it can now start predicting that given given photometry. Uh, so, so in that sense, I, I think the answer to that question fully depends on what one wants to use these photometric redshifts for. Um, I think relevant, however, is as I mentioned, these models are only as good as the data they have seen, right? So, if we train the model fully just on the SCSS data, and then you came with some extremely high redshift galaxy. Where you did have measurements in UGR set and W1, W2, so we could input it to the model, then most likely this model would spit out some bogus value, right? That we would classify as an outlier if we did have the spectroscopic redshift, but we would be none the wiser if we didn't. And that is actually one of the reasons why I'm excited about model three, since we can calculate this joint distribution P said comma X, because mm -hmm. we can link that probability to um, outliers calculated from the training set or from the test set, et cetera, then we could potentially use that as some kind of quality flag to try to highlight these cases where we are out of bounds with regard to data the model has seen before. But of course, if we want to create a model that's as general as possible, I mean, the more data, the better. Okay, thanks very much. Of course. Okay, and let us thank Jakob one more time for an excellent talk. Thank you. So our next speaker is Aidan Sedgwick. Aidan, do you want to go ahead and share your screen? Perfect. We can see your slides. Can you hear me as well? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, as Rachel mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to speak today about some of the work that we have been doing to prepare for spectroscopic follow-up of uh, Ruben LSST transient alerts. And specifically, uh, this Kickstarter project was to investigate how to automatically prioritize these targets for follow-up observations with the Danish telescope, which is in Chile. Um, so the Danish is a 1.5 meter telescope 
on Lucia in Chile. Um, and it's around 100 kilometers from the LSST site, which means it's a good uh, candidate um, observatory for follow-up observations of these alerts. It, basically, if an, a target can be seen by LSST, then it's very likely to be seen by the Danish as well because it's so close by. Um, yes, so this is particularly true for um, the rapid follow-up observations that we hope to be able to do with the, um, the Danish because, well, it will, we plan them to happen in the same night or within a few hours of the um, alerts from the LSST. So this project is part of a, a wider collaboration, um, which is refurbishing the, the Danish telescope, which has already refurbished the Danish telescope rather, to enable it to do remote observations. And the uh, spectrographic component of the instrument mounted on the Danish, the DFOSC, is currently being recommissioned and it has a wavelength coverage from 320 nanometers to about a micron, which is very similar to the LSST UGRIZ filters. Um, the grisms available for spectroscopy give um, res spectral resolutions from around 350 to 1000, um, depending on which, um, well, the, the spectral resolution and the, the wavelength interval sort of go together. The higher resolution is for a smaller wavelength range. And the, um, the main constraint that we have from the Danish or the DFOSC is the uh, integration times or reasonable integration times sort of limit us to an I-band magnitude of about 19th magnitude. And as I mentioned, it, it, the Danish is planned in part, at least, to be used for um, rapid spectroscopic follow-up of these alerts. But the problem will be that there will be so many alerts, uh, it will be a task to choose which ones are the most interesting to follow up. Um, so the alerts from LSST, these, these transient alerts, will be distributed by a number of alert brokers. And these brokers are currently also running on uh, the ZTF, trans Zwicky Transient Facility data in the optical G and R bands. So we have initially started our um, investigation for this project using the Fink broker, but there was no strong motivation to choose Fink over any of the other brokers available. Um, we were inspired in part because of a, a TBS uh, colloquia from Anise Murla earlier this year. Um, so along with the um, photometric and astrometric data from ZTF that is broadcast with an alert, Fink also provides a classification and a classification probability of each of the photometric data points, um, and then rebroadcasts these in streams according to this classification. And because of the um, scientific interests of some of the collaborators in some some of our collaborators in dark, we have chosen initially to listen for the SN candidate stream and the early one A candidate streams. Uh, so the screenshot on the right is just an example of one nice light curve from Fink showing the photometric data and um, sort of the the metadata that comes with Fink. And the, the bar at the top is showing the various classifications and how these can change or not with, uh, in, with very, the various photometric data points. So another survey that... Um, that is available is the Atlas survey, which is a very high cadence imaging survey, um, which is operating at around 500 and 700 nanometers. Um, one of the constraints that Atlas has is that it's limited to around limited to around 19 and a half magnitudes in these these two bands. That they provide but this isn't really going to be a problem for the danish because as i mentioned the the limit that we are working to anyway is around 19. so if we if it can be observed with atlas we will be able to if it can be observed with the danish then we will be able to use utilize atlas photometry. uh the data from the atlas is only a very recent addition to the work that we have been doing here so we've only very recently implemented this 
Um, and the screenshot on the right is the, the very, you can see the very high cadence um, of com in comparison to the ZTF, um, which was on the previous slide. Um, this is the same target as which was in that slide. So now that we have our data and we know that there will be an enormous number of targets, thousands of targets per hour from or thousands of alerts per hour from LSST, one of the uh, issues that we're going to have is to choose which target we should take the next spectra of. Um, there are many, many reasons that one could choose a target and, and say that this is the most interesting target. Um, but the issue is that we can only have one next best target to take spectra of. Um, so the, the one way that we could get around this is by trying to reduce each target into a single score number, uh, a single number, which is a score, um, which tries to balance the, uh, the competing factors for what might make a target interesting for observation. Um, so the cartoon on the right shows the so shows a sort of outline of the code that we have built so far to to do this for the Danish. Um, the first thing that in in each loop that happens is that, that we have these query managers, which, for instance, listen for new alerts from Fink or submit new um, re requests to the Atlas Force Photometry servers. And then either updates existing targets with this new data or adds these targets to the currently unranked list of targets. We then build a model for each of these targets, um, a model for each of the light curves of these targets based on the ZTF and now Atlas data using the Python package SN Cosmo. Each target with its coordinates and uh, light curve and model is then passed to this scoring function, which is the thing which will produce the single number, the score. Um, and we point out that the code is built to be modular so that this scoring function that we am going to show in the rest of this talk is just one example. So in principle, anybody could write their own scoring function um, to rank targets based on any astrophysical phenomena that they choose. Um, the, the whole code is written in Python, so the idea is that you should be able to write one Python function um, and use the, uh, the coordinates and the alerts and perhaps models if you choose to build your own target prioritization lists. Um, as I mentioned, um, it is useful because we are interested in supernova to have models of these supernova light curves. Um, and we want to investigate how well we can predict the peak of the supernova light curve um, for, for target prioritization if we are interested in, for instance, selecting targets of supernova at their peak. Um, for a large number of uh, well-sampled light curves from Fink, we fit, the, we fit with SN Cosmo these SALT2 models um, and use the parameter that, that they provide, the zero phase parameter, as an estimate of when the, the peak brightness is. Um, and then using the first n alerts for each of these supernova, we refit models and compare how the, the subset model t0 value compares with the best estimate that we have from fitting the whole light curve. The plot on the right shows the difference between this best value and the values using the subsets of the light curves as a function of supernova light curve phase in days. Um, we have broken this down into these three redshift, uh, not redshift ranges, three magnitude ranges rather based on the R band magnitude. Um, the green range at the bottom is effectively the as faint as the Danish will be able to observe. Um, and the important conclusion to draw from this really is that until the best estimate of the peak, we continue to estimate the peak sooner than it actually is um, for the faintest targets. This is slightly less bad for the brighter magnitude ranges, but the number, the statistics here are um, less good. There are far fewer bright, bright supernova than there are faint supernova. One criticism that 
you could make of this kind of analysis is that it's not it might not really be fair to compare or to use the best estimate as a good uh, indicator of how well we can do this if if the if the best estimate is is bad if the model fit from the whole light curve was bad then you would never know if you don't have spectroscopically confirmed targets uh light curves but this is kind of the the way that we will be working in the with the danish we won't already have spectra so this is still sort of a, an interesting thing to to look at on this slide i have plotted um for four different sort of regimes the same light curve that we were showing before and the models that they fit so in the top left i have a very very early selected um supernova with um with only five data points from from Fink <clears throat> and the models that we can fit with this. So the well, there, there is a model, and we do we do predict a, a peak at some point in the future, which is a good a good place to start. But we can see that when we add more, or if we observe this target when it's at a later phase on the top right, the uh, the peak value has shifted forward in time by about um, five days. Similarly, if we add uh, the Atlas data the on the bottom left, the peak value is much closer to the, the, the value we expect from the, the later observed target. <clears throat> and the later observed target with ZTF and Atlas data is uh, presumably the, the best fit of all. Um, yes. The next slide is detailing for our specific science cases, selecting early supernova and supernova at the peak, how we exactly compute this score that I mentioned earlier. So the idea, as I said, is to break each target down into the number a number of competing factors, which would be the reasons why you would want to observe this target. So we want to observe in the top right, bright targets. So we define this factor um as effectively the definition of or a slight modification to the definition of magnitudes so a target which increases in magnitude has a exponentially larger score so for instance a target at the the limit of around 18 and a half will have a factor based on its brightness of one whereas a factor a, a target with a magnitude of about 16 and a half will be have a factor of 10 on its brightness. In the top right, um, there is a little description of the how we consider the targets to be rising. So for in each of the bands, we look at the number of alerts which are brighter than their previous one and compute the fraction of the this the, the alerts which are brighter than the previous one. So if a if a a target has a, a rising factor of one, then all of the alerts are continuing to rise. Whereas if it's much less than this, we can infer that it has turned over or there is it's there are significant er errors in the photometry. Um, in the bottom left, there is this sort of ad hoc interest factor that we have defined to sort of balance between the two science cases, selecting young and um, supernova at the peak so using this t0 value that we were looking at in the, the in the previous couple of slides which is the the time from the peak we use this as an input to this this function here and the output we use is this interest factor so for very young targets minus 20 which isn't really feasible but uh, just a definition um the, the score is very high again at around 10 and the this declines quite rapidly as the supernova approach approaches the peak but then there is a small peak which increases this interest factor for supernova which are currently at the peak um, and finally the in the bottom right we we really want to to consider targets which are actually observable from the site in the sea right it's not very good to observe to, to, to think about observing targets that you can't actually see in the sky so one simple way that we have thought to do this is to just consider the um, the air mass of the of the the current position of the target in the sky. 
which is some function of one over the altitude. So this is sort of an observing chart um, based at the, the start of the night. Um, and it shows the progression of the altitude of a, a given target throughout the, the night. And the factor that we take from this is actually one over the air mass. So as targets reach very, very low altitudes, um, the air mass increases. And so we would demote these targets. And once we have all of our factors defined, we can essentially multiply them all together, take the product of the, all of these things in an attempt to balance all of these factors out. And then once we have done this for all of the targets, it's simply a case of choosing the target with the highest score. The, ab the absolute value of the score is not so important. It's the, the size of the score relative to all of the other targets. And you can imagine that if you included more and more factors of, of, of a good target, each having around 10, then the score could increase very rapidly. But like I say, it's not the absolute value that's so important. The final, one of the final slides I have to show is um, a little experiment we did by scraping a number of months of uh, data from the Fink archive and looking at how many new interesting targets we would get with this example of the score each night. Um, so on the right is a histogram of the number of targets per 100 alerts per night that we take. And there is an average of around two. Um, so the difference between no alerts and zero is that when the ZTF survey was not observing because of weather conditions, for instance, and nights when we actually did not accept any of the targets per 100 alerts. So obviously this, um, this experiment is not um, really representative of what LSST will be like because of the differences in cadence and the differences in um, well, the number of alerts for to begin with, and also the the filters that ZTF use are fewer than those in ZTF. And finally, as this is an ongoing project, there are many many improvements that we would like to make. To begin with, there is existing the Tom toolkit, which is an, a very extensive set of tools, to um, the which is a telescope and observation observations management system, and we hope to integrate our um, algorithm, our scoring system into the TOM toolkit and use the, the extensive tools that are available there to our advantage as well. As I mentioned earlier, also, there are many more brokers than Fink available, each of which, or many of which, also provide target classifications. And we can use the combinations of these um, probabilities, the confidence of these, each of these brokers to increase the, the score for our targets. If both think and say alerts say that something is a supernova 1A, then we can be quite a, a lot more confident in the, the classifications than if we only choose one broker. Um, as I showed with including the Atlas uh, data, more sampled, more well sampled light curves, let us get fit better models for the very early targets. So we would look to see if there were any more publicly available, accessible uh, photo photometric surveys to improve our modeling. Um, there is also a transient name server out there, which is a regularly updated uh, server of the latest um, transient and spectroscopically confirmed targets. Um, so we could use the information from this either to perhaps remove targets which have already been observed from our own list, or to perhaps a bit less harshly use the redshift to produce better models to catch the supernova at exactly the right peak, exactly there on the peak, rather than using our photometric only models. Um, and of course, there will be the data preview DP0 simulations, which will help us to prepare for LSST when our, whereas our uh, current implementation is based on the ZTF data rather than um, the actual alerts, which will be from LSST. Um, so the code is still in development and uh, what comments and suggestions are please welcomed. And that's uh, all from me, thank you.
Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Aidan, for a very interesting talk. That's a really powerful algorithm you've developed. And I can see straight away that we have a question from Marcus Huntermark. Um, Marcus, can I ask you to read the question for the benefit of the recording? Yes, of course. I was just wondering um, what the time allocation at the Danish um, is looking uh, looking like. So in the coming years, um, how much time and uh, will the Danish be operational in the in the course of the LSST? So the um, as far as I'm aware, the re recommissioning of the DFOSC instrument will be finished at some point in 23. Um, and I think that um, LSST is due to be online at some point in 24, right? But as for the exact um, fraction of time which will be devoted to this project, I, I'm not certain. I haven't been so involved in the um, actual management of the Danish, rather only this um, project. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks so much. And of course, the same algorithm could be applied to many and other telescopes. So this oh, yes, is yes. a very, very general purpose useful. Um, so I wanted to follow up with you about the um, interest function that I think you had on a previous slide. Yes. And I, I note see. that you said that it could be, this is an element of the package that you would, um, a user might be able to adapt to their particular observing program given their science goals. But I was interested to see one feature of your interest function is that you concentrate very specifically on young supernovae or ones that are actually at the peak. But I know that supernovae uh, evolve in their spectral function as well as their photometry as a function of time. And it's often interesting to continue to monitor them. And a this function um, would not do that. As far as I can tell, you are only looking for effectively a single visit to the target at the very early phases, and you would not then come back to it at a later stage. Was that a deliberate design choice, or is that um, something that you are looking to expand into? It's certainly something that we could expand into. It was a deliberate choice in that we um, wanted to have some idea of targets that we would like to select just so that we could begin to develop this algorithm around a goal rather than doing it in the in the most generic case possible if that makes mm. sense yeah absolutely and it really comes down to how you want to use the telescope and what science goals um exactly. you have uh, for a particular program so i love the fact that you've made it modular because then that a user could take it and adapt it for whatever they choose does anyone else have, uh, we have time for maybe a couple of quick questions if anyone wants to post them in the chat. Since we are looking at this slide, um, I will just comment and have you included the uh, moon phase at all in your observability function? Because I notice um, your, your targets, a lot of them are going to be fairly faint. Yes, so the the... That we have considered that it's not explicitly included in there yet, but it um, given the 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 AstroPy tools that we use to calculate these or to draw these um, observing charts, the distance to the moon would not be difficult to calculate from this, um, and I imagine that it would be a case of including some factor based on the great circle distance to the moon. And if it's very, very close, then we just don't observe this target at the current time. Fair enough. That makes sense. So, Warren, did you have a comment? No, I, I didn't actually, Rachel. I just uh, I wanted to. Uh, this is it's been really interesting for me, Aidan. I'm I'm just thinking about um, uh, the operation of uh, a big observatory. And uh, and how we would respond to uh, to alert. So th this has been really interesting. I think I might be reaching out to you at some point in the next few months. Uh, please so, do, uh, yeah, uh, please uh, add me to your spam list so so you don't get uh, <laughs> get overwhelmed. Thanks very much. Thanks, Warren. And I see a number of comments in the chat um, congratulating you on you on some excellent work here. So thank you, Aidan, once again. Thank you. 
And let me wrap up now by thanking both Aidan and Yakov for two excellent talks. Um, it looks like the follow-up program for Supernovae is in very good hands. So uh, congratulations once again. And thank you all uh, for coming to our Kickstarter Colloquium today. I have just to wrap up with a quick reminder that we have the last uh, Kickstarter Colloquium on Wednesday uh, before the break for the winter holidays. So I hope to see you all then. I will be circulating an advert very soon. So thanks everybody very much and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.